Filters are an important consideration for any photographer. In landscape photography, you'll find yourself using two filters over and over again, the polarizing filter and the split neutral density filters. On occasion, I do use a haze filter to protect my lens, but generally I stick with my lens cap for lens protection. The haze filter I'll put on if I'm near the beach or if I'm near some geysers in Yellowstone or something where there's chemicals coming up and I still need to photograph. But most of the time I use my polarizing filter as a haze filter for protection. Uh, the reason for this is, is because the polarizing filter is so important and I find that I use it so much of the time, probably about 85% of the time, that I rarely take it off. The trick to the polarizer is if you can see that it's doing something to help your scene, leave it on. If you can't see any change, then take it off. And as I said, with the polarizer, I find that I use it most of the time. So therefore, I don't tend to stack it with a haze filter. Now, part of the problem with using haze filters are that you get a little bit lazy and you tend to stack the polarizer on top of the haze filter or the split neutral density filter on top of the haze filter. And anytime you stack glass on top of each other, you're lowering the quality of your image. Now you've probably just gone out and spent several hundreds of dollars on a lens only to stack some filters on it and degrade the quality. So try to keep your filters or your glass as clear as possible and use one filter at a time. So let's start with the polarizing filter. The way we're going to use this filter, and indeed any filter for that matter, is we'll find our lens with the largest lens thread. Here, my largest lens thread is 77 millimeters. So what I'll do is if I have smaller filters, I'm going to buy the filter for the largest lens thread and then use a step-up ring. These are relatively inexpensive um, and they're much cheaper than buying multiple filters for different lenses. And that step-up ring is going to take you from a smaller filter size, like this is 67, up to the 77 filter. This way you can have one filter and several step-up rings to fit your other lenses. This is a far cheaper way to go and, and it's fairly efficient. Now, as time goes by, if you want to add to your set for convenience, I find that a polarizing filter for each lens is quite helpful. The polarizing filter is probably the filter you're going to get the most use out of for outdoor photography. We can see that it does at least four different things here, but let's start with darkens blue skies. This is what most people consider the polarizer used for. Here I'm up on the sand dunes looking up at a friend of mine, and I, as I spin the polarizer, the sky gets much darker. It's usually more flattering. More times than not, a darker blue sky is helpful to your scene. But the polarizer doesn't work in every direction. For example, if we're standing in the middle of this blue circle and the yellow sun is off to our left shoulder, you can't polarize towards the sun or away from the sun. But you can polarize at 90 degrees to the sun. So I can polarize in that direction or looking to the top of the circle. And even when you're at the right angle, you're not going to be able to polarize the whole sky as seen here but rather a smaller segment of it. The amount of sky that you can polarize is about equal to what a 35 millimeter lens would see. So you're looking somewhere around 40 degrees. That's not exact, it's approximate. But if you're using a wide angle lens, you can actually include more of the sky than can be polarized. So be careful when using a, a wide angle lens in a horizontal manner. If you've got a wide angle lens in a vertical manner, you'll probably run into less problems. Nevertheless, the polarizing filter shows you exactly what you're going to get. There is no tricks here. As you spin that polarizer on the front of your lens, you can see whether you're including part of the sky that is not polarizing. Just need to be mindful. Here we are again. The sun is off to my left, as you can see in the shadows here. And when I spin the polarizing filter, the sky gets much darker, much more flattering to the scene. Really works around those magic light times too. Here we can see some sunset uh, color on the clouds here and when I polarize it darkens the blue sky around it and really makes those clouds jump out. 
A lot of people say the polarizer affects the clouds, and it actually doesn't. What it really does is darkens down the blue sky. And when it darkens the blue sky down, the clouds seem to be brighter. Same thing here. Late light on the clouds, spinning the polarizer, darkens the blue sky down a little bit. Now, the polarizer is not something that you have to uh, think about your metering for. You really can just screw it onto the front of your lens, polarize your scene, and shoot. However, in this shot, it darkened down my blue sky a little bit, so my camera automatically brightened up my exposure. So here's a lighter blue sky, and then polarizers darkening it down a little bit. But if you notice, I'm actually getting a little bit more detail down in the bottom because I am brightening up my scene somewhat. So again, brighter sky, and then as you polarize, the camera brightens up the exposure a little bit, and now we're seeing some detail down here in the bottom. Now the polarizer is not an on-off filter. It does have many different degrees in which it can work. Here's an unpolarized sky down in Death Valley, and spinning the polarizer a little bit, notice that it darkens the blue sky down. Also notice it picks up, or I should say enhances the color in the hillsides as well. So let me go back. By spinning the polarizer, we darken the blue sky down a little bit, and the colors in here become somewhat more brilliant. But you can actually spin the polarizer even more and get an even darker sky. So, the polarizer is not an on-off filter, but has many different degrees. I'd also like you to take a, a notice here that I am looking at part of the sky that is not being polarized. So this is what you can be careful for. This is not a wide-angle lens. It's a longer lens, but I just happen to be pointing to a section of the sky where I'm not getting full polarization. So let me go back one, two to the beginning. Notice that we're getting some polarization, and now on this spin of the polarizer, I darken more on the right hand side than I do on the left. Now this side is much darker than this side. This is just something to be aware of. You can't always get around it and sometimes you're going to you're going to want to have this effect and sometimes you're not. I find that it's most noticeable in blank blue skies such as this one where there's no clouds to break up the sky. So just be careful, use your own good judgment and realize that the whole sky cannot always be polarized. reduces haze. This is a great use of the polarizing filter. There are haze filters out there, folks, but they're not nearly as effective as the polarizer is. You'll see it mostly with longer lenses. So here this is probably about a 70 millimeter lens looking into the distance, and you can see the buildup of haze. Longer lens tend to magnify and compress the haze and make it more noticeable. Watch what happens when you spin the polarizer. Cleans it up just a little bit. Notice that the colors become more brilliant as well. We'll go back. No polarizer. And spinning the polarizer. So, if you need to reduce haze, reach for the polarizing filter before the haze filter. You're going to find that it's much more aggressive and does a much better job. Saturates color. This is a big one for me. I'll use this uh, about 85% of the time just to simply saturate the color in a scene. Sometimes it's subtle, sometimes it's very noticeable. Some azalea bushes down in Georgia have just the slightest little bit of glare on the leaves. I want you to notice right around in here and in some of these leaves in here, just a little bit of glare and that polarizing filter brings back the color. This is a subtle use. Let me go back one more time. Again, watch those leaves. There's the glare. There's without the glare. So consider that polarizing filter to remove glare and saturate colors. Here's some fall foliage in Glacier National Park uh, later in the afternoon. And spin that polarizer just a little bit and those colors just get so deeply saturated. It's the glare that's actually the problem. And you can find this glare on rocks, on leaves, anything that has a waxy or somewhat shiny surface. Certainly shiny, like the top of the water or the lily pads here. So again, glare on an overcast day, the polarizer is just going to clean that glare out and you're just gonna see massive saturated color come through. 
It also removes reflections. This can be a benefit or a hindrance depending on how you look at it and how you're wanting to use it, but I find that it works quite well. So here's a middle of the day shot, nothing too impressive, very, very blue, but notice how when you put the polarizer on, it not only takes out that blue cast, but it also darkens down the sky and cuts the glare on the water and removes the reflection so you can see into the bottom. Let's go back again and check that out. Blue reflection of the sky, lighter sky, and an overall cool cast to your scene. The polarizer darkens the blue sky, cuts the reflection on the water, and warms the scene up. Now, as mentioned before with the blue sky, your polarizing filter is not an on-off filter. You can use it in several different degrees. So here's the filter, uh, not spun at all, so it's in its zero position. And this is a wet wall down in Zion National Park, and so the areas of wetness here are actually reflecting the blue sky, but the true color of the stone is more like this orange color. So let's see what happens as we spin our polarizer. Spin it a little bit, and it starts to cut the glare. A little bit more, and you're cutting more glare. So in this situation, I've shot it three different ways at three different variations of the polarizer, and I recommend checking that out on different shots because you may find that one angle may be a little bit better than another. Split neutral density filters reduce the difference in brightness between elements within your scene. This is going to be a constant occurrence when you're shooting around the magic hours. We've seen this photograph earlier. The sky is very bright, the warm sunlight on the mountain is very bright, but we're in the shadow of a mountain, so our foreground is completely dark. You open up to get the bottom of the scene, and now your sky blows out. So this is a perfect situation where you can use a split neutral density filter. And a split neutral density filter is a piece of glass that's uh, tinted at the top and clear at the bottom. In this case, this is a Galen Rowell uh, split neutral density filter from Singray, and it's a uh, two-stop graduated soft. And what you would do is you would take this filter and you would put it over this scene so that the dark part is at the top, and then that is going to allow this to become darker while we have the exposure bright enough to make this illuminated. So, the split neutral density filters come in a couple different models. You see one on the left is hard, the one on the right is soft, and what that's referring to is the amount of gradient. This is a fairly hard gradient, whereas this is going to be very, very soft going across your scene. Galen used to say that a three-stop hard and a two-stop soft would get you through most situations, and I, I agree with him. I think that was very good advice. But they do make a three-stop hard and a two-stop hard a two-stop soft and a three-stop soft and a one-stop soft. So there's lots of different models out there to choose from. But if you're going to just pick two, I agree with Galen. Three-stop hard, two-stop soft. Now the way that we're going to attach the filter is actually fairly simple and quite ingenious. Again, we look to the lens for its filter thread size. So here I've got a, a 58 millimeter filter thread on my camera around my lens and so I'm going to use a 58 millimeter adapter ring and what's called a Koken P filter holder and that's this part out here. Now you'll get different size adapter rings uh, for all of your lenses. Here again we've got a 58, this is probably a 62, I've got a 67 and a 77. So you buy the adapter rings for all your different thread sizes but you only need one Koken P filter holder and you slide the different adapter rings in the back and then in the front the filter slides down in. So this one filter with the several different adapters and one piece of glass will work on various different lenses that you own. Now what they're going to do is they're going to take situations like this and allow you to darken the sky down by just one stop with using a one stop soft split neutral density filter. Or take a scene like this up in the mountains of Glacier National Park with a a sunset that's uh, setting into a very very smoky horizon and when you expose for the the sky up in here the foreground is too dark. Expose for the foreground and the sky is too light. A two-stop neutral density filter 
takes care of that. In this situation down in the mountains of Colorado, very, very bright clouds, and you can see deep shadow of the mountain here. So if you were to open up and expose for this, the white clouds would be completely blown out. The only choice here is to use a split neutral density filter. In this case, it's a two-stop soft to bring the detail into the sky and allow the shadows to be illuminated enough for us to see into them. In this case, the difference between the sky and the foreground is very bright. It's three stops difference here. So in this case, I had to use a three stop hard. So this is the exposure for the background and this is the exposure for the foreground. And use a three stop neutral density filter. In this case, I believe it was a hard and it's going to drop that down just enough to make the photograph seem like it makes sense to the viewer's eye. So how do we meter for these split neutral density filters? Well, it's not too hard actually. What you want to do is consider the scene as two separate parts. So the foreground is the darker part of the scene while the sky or background is the lighter part of the scene. Begin by metering the average tone in your foreground or your darker area. Uh, this is going to be your exposure. This is where you'll set your camera when you shoot. Now, meter the average tone in the highlight area. Then simply determine the difference in stops between your shadow brightness and your highlight brightness. The difference in stops is the strength of the split neutral density filter you'll use. So let's look at it this way. You find your average tone in the darker area, your foreground. Let's say that's a quarter of a second at f11. Then you find out how bright the midtone is in your brighter area, and let's say that's a fifteenth of a second at f11. Well, we were at a quarter of a second at f11, that's where we want to set our camera. And then a quarter goes to an eighth to a fifteenth, and that was the meter reading up in the sky. Well, that's two stops. So if you put on a two stop neutral density filter, you will get the shot that you need. Let's look at it a little bit uh, a little bit more closely. We find our average tone and zero at our meter on our foreground area. So here we set it at a half of a second at 22 and you can see we are zeroed out on our average tone in the foreground. And then we meter our highlight area and we can see that at a half of a second at f22 it's going to be blown out and we can tell because it's blinking. Um, if you had a Nikon camera you'd have a little arrow here indicating to you that it's overexposed. So at one half of a second at 22 it'll make this tone average but it will blow out the sky. Okay so now we just need to figure out how bright the sky is, how much brighter the sky is than our average tone here. So we close down from a half of a second at 22 to a quarter of a second at 22 and that puts this tone now at a plus two position. That's close, but maybe we want it a little bit darker. We could probably shoot it like that. That would be okay. Let's go down to an eighth of a second at 22. Now it's going to be darker yet. It's going to be at a plus one. So we began at a half of a second, went to a quarter, went to an eighth. That's two stops difference. So we're going to set our camera at a half of a second. That'll give us a good foreground exposure, but it will blow out our background. But then we simply add two stops of neutral density filter and we've got the scene that we need. So let's take a look at another one. We'll begin by looking into our foreground and finding an average tone like this red ice plant here. And in setting it at a 30th at 16, we see that we are just at a minus 1. We want that to be average, so we'll go up to a 15th at 16. And that's where we want to set our camera, ultimately. We want to shoot our shot at a 15th at f16. But now we need to find the difference in, in brightness, so we'll go up to the top. And, of course, it shows that it's blowing out. You can see the blinking. 
And uh, once again, if you had a Nikon, you'd see a little arrow here instead. All right, so we'll begin to bring this down. 15th at f16 goes down to a 30th at f16. And that puts us at a plus two, maybe a hair bright still. So we go a 60th at f16. And one one twenty fifth at f16. And that's going to be nice and dark, and that's going to be complementary to our foreground. So let's see what that gives us. We began at a 15th at f16, and going up to 1 1 25th is three stops. So we set our camera at a 15th at f16 and use a three stop neutral density filter. 15th at 16. And that's what we're going to set our camera at. That's what we're going to shoot. And we add three stops of split neutral density filter. And it darkens our scene down. Let's look at one more. We say that we want to find our uh, middle tone in our foreground in our darker area. But we don't always need to set that to the zero point. Sometimes that may look a little bit fake. And you'll need to experiment with this on your own. But let me show you an example. Here we find our average, or what should be average, this green grass in the bottom. But we can see this heavy shadow here. So our eye knows that this is a darker area. If we bring it up to a zero point, it may be just a little bit too much. So instead of bringing it up to the zero, we'll just set it at a 30th at 22, F22, which gives us a minus one setting rather than a zero setting. Now, when we go up into the clouds, of course it's blown out, so we need to close down a little bit to a 60th at 22, and then 1 125th at 22. So that was 30th to 1 125th, that's two stops. So we set it at a 30th, and again, instead of putting this into a perfectly average midtone, we're putting it just a little bit darker and hopefully this will be a little bit more believable and then we use a two-stop neutral density filter so a thirtieth of a second is what we shoot at two-stop neutral density filter and our scene tends to look a little bit more realistic so you're going to want to experiment with putting your uh... your foreground your darker area into both a midtone and also try putting it into something just a little bit darker than a midtone, you might find that a little bit more believable. Now, when it comes to post-processing, you don't always have to use split neutral density filters. This is the wonderful thing about computers. I used to use split neutral density filters in the field all of the time. It was the only tool that we had when we were using film. Um, but now that uh, the Photoshop and Lightroom have come along as, as far as they have, I find it a little bit easier to work in the computer than I do out in the field. Now, my number one mantra is the highest quality images that you can make. So, if working out in the field made the higher quality image, that's where I would do it. In this case, working on the computer gives me a higher quality image, so that's where I'm going to do it. This doesn't come from uh, laziness or the you know the ability to do something easier what I'm trying to do is create the finest imagery that we can possibly create the split neutral density filters are fine if that is all that you have however it's yet another piece of glass in front of your lens and that is ultimately going to degrade the quality of your image a little bit you can create the same effect in Photoshop and it gives you a little bit more control um, I find that I don't have to fiddle with it out in the field, which allows a little bit more concentration at the task at hand. Uh, then when I get home and work in Photoshop, I've got a little more control and I can do it at my leisure rather than feeling pressured. In addition to creating a split neutral density filter in Photoshop, there's plenty of different ways that you can blend your images together using different types of software. Now, we're going to cover these different uh, ways to blend your images together using Photoshop and Photomatix and sev several different things. But um, for now, we're going to need to know what we uh, have to do out in the field to, to get our shots and ready them for the computer. 
And it's simply, folks, bringing home the correct exposures. It's a lot easier than you may think it is. Um, when we're using split neutral density filters, we need to calculate our exposures out in the field, decide where we're going to put things, use the split neutral density filter right away. But when we're using this method, we just need to bring home the right series of shots. We want good highlight detail. We want good shadow detail. So the series is going to consist of however many shots is necessary. It could be two, it could be four, it could be five, it could be six. It all depends. We just need to have good detail in the sky. And in this case, you can see that there's plenty of detail. It's not blown out. And in this case, I'm just going to keep opening up until I get good detail in the shadows down here. And once you get all four of these images, you bring them home, put them on the computer, and you can blend them together to make it look more like what your eye saw as you were standing there at the scene. So here's a sunset. Um, again, it shows how the camera has the inability to capture both very bright detail and very dark detail. So I'm going to get the exposure here for my highlights, make sure that's good. And then I'm simply going to open up, open up again, and open up again. And now that's my last good shot for my shadows. And I'll take all those images into the computer and blend them together to create, once again, what it looks like when our eye sees. You can bracket these exposures in full stops, which is typically what I do. Some of the software manufacturers recommend you bracket those in two stops. I found that either a stop, stop and a half, or two stops, they all work just fine. For me, I stick to one stop. You can also use auto bracketing on your camera, and this way you don't have to touch your uh, dials in between exposures. And some cameras will allow you to set three different exposures, or four different exposures, or five different exposures, or six, and that's all up to you. But we just need the entire spread that is going to give us the good highlight detail and the good shadow detail. So you'll need to calculate that in the field. I separate mine once again by one stop each shot. So let's look at this and let's try to be a little bit more accurate. If we came up to this scene, we could meter the foreground and say, I want that to be an average tonality. So an eighth of a second at F16 puts this green in our average tone right here. It zeroes out. So now we'll take that shot and we'll put our meter up into the sky and we can see that that's blowing out. So we'll shoot another shot, but this time at a 15th at 16. Then another shot at a 30th at 16. And you can see that puts the sky down here at a plus one and that's a pretty good place. And then ultimately we could shoot it at a 60th at 16 and put the average blue sky back at average. Now we'll take all those images home, load them up onto the computer and either blend them together using Photoshop or use a split neutral density filter or whatever method you decide upon. So the goal is to get the good exposures before we go home. So we're going to do everything we can to make sure that our images are sharp, well aligned, and the correct exposure. So we begin, once again, by taking a meter reading from an average tone. And here it shows us that if we set our camera to one second at f22, that tone will be average. All right, now, before we actually make any other shots, or before we even take the shots, let's see what our entire spread is, and then we can shoot all our shots at once. So. This is one second at F22. We put the meter up into the sky and we can see that it's blinking, which means it's going to blow out. So one second at 22 is not going to be good for that. Half of a second at 22. Okay, that's still blinking. Go down another stop. Quarter at 22. Still blinking. And finally, when we get to an eighth at 22, it stops blinking, which lets us know that's going to be a plus two value. But we may even want it a little bit darker than that, maybe in a plus one. So that's one fifteenth of a second. So now we know our spread. Our spread goes from one second to a half second to a quarter to an eighth to a fifteenth. That's four different shots. So we can either set up our auto bracketing or we can do it manually. But now we know our spread. 
and we can bring those four images back and blend them together on our computer to get something that that uh, is more similar to what we perceived when we were there. So folks, the most important thing is to get our images correct out in the field. We want to have absolute tack sharpness, we want to have good uh, composition, we want to have the good exposures, uh, all the proper exposures for blending them together. If you're using the split neutral density filter out in the field, don't be afraid to bracket your shots and try different things. It's a little bit difficult at first to get all the metering down, especially when the light's moving fast and you're, you're having to you know, very quickly uh, consider your different options. So take your time um, and just ensure that you do lots of different brackets. Then you'll have plenty to work with when you get back home. So in the next section, we'll cover some other tips and tricks that will help you out in the field. And then we'll finish out the video with exploring how we can use Photoshop and Photomatix to further enhance our images.